And it's my distinct pleasure to call you to order for an annual event that gives me personally, and I know each of you, enormous pleasure, the presentation of our annual Silurian's Lifetime Achievement Award. We also, however, have one person we have to take note of before that, and to thank immensely, and that is our dinner chairman, chairperson, Eileen Jacobson. Eileen, take a bow. Trust me, none of this would be possible without her, and none of you would know where you were seating, seated without her. So, anyway. Um, and if there aren't enough of you here, that's my fault, but you are a wonderful crowd. There are few awards that are more appropriate for the Silurians to award, few awards more appropriate than this one. Since so many of us have spent most of our lives laboring in these same vineyards, we all understand so deeply just what a lifetime of achievement what it means in journalism to have a lifetime of achievement. But this evening, we happen to be blessed to have someone who knows our honoree even better, certainly longer, than yours truly. So before I take up any more of your valuable time, let me bring up our distinguished governor and former Times colleague, Warren Hogue, who someone tells me actually has an interesting tale to tell, maybe two or three or four, about our awardee tonight. One of the things I'm proudest of from my four decades of newspapering is that I'm the guy who gave Ken Oletta his first job in journalism. It didn't go well. He was fired after two weeks. But that was more than 40 years ago, and he obviously rebounded since we are here tonight to give him our award for a lifetime of achievement. It's a life of remarkable accomplishment, and in truth, even that early brush with unaccustomed failure wasn't his fault. The year was 1974. I was the city editor of the New York Post, and my publisher, Dorothy Schiff, was desperate to name a political columnist. Ken was already a good friend of mine and had been working for Howard Samuels, the first head of New York's off-track betting corporation. Those of you who knew Howard will remember that he was known by the Guys and Dolls moniker, Howie the Horse. He had just failed in his fourth try at becoming governor of New York, losing the Democratic primary race to Brooklyn Congressman Hugh Carey. Ken was only 32 at the time, but he knew more about political life in New York than anyone I knew. I had no idea whether he could write but Ken rapidly made the front page, and we were all very impressed. All of us, that is, except for Governor Kerry. He apparently called Mrs. Schiff and berated her for entrusting the job of New York Post political columnist to the top aide of his rival, Howard Samuels. Mrs. Schiff's next call was to me and I was soon in Ken's West Side apartment telling him that he was fired. <laughs> that, of course, turned out to be the launch of quite a journalistic life. Ken became, in quick order, a staff writer and weekly columnist for The Village Voice, a contributing editor at New York Magazine, a weekly columnist for The Daily News. He moderated television debates on Channel 13, and did on-the-air political commentary for WCBS-TV, working with anchor Jim Jensen. By 1977, his talent at long-form journalism had brought him ambitious assignments from The New Yorker's William Sean and The New York Times's Abe Rosenthal and Arthur Gelb. And in 1992, he began his series of revealing behind the veil portraits of media moguls and mockers in his Annals of Communications pieces in The New Yorker. Those columns, in turn, led to best-selling books, 12 of them. And just the mention of a couple of the titles will remind you of how knowing he was about what was going on in communications and how prescient he was about the revolutionary changes to come. In 1986, there was greed and glory on Wall Street, 
the fall of the House of Lehman. In 1997, the highwaymen, the warriors of the information superhighway. In 2001, World War 3.0, Microsoft and its enemies. And in 2009, Googled the end of the world as we know it. I was the editor of the New York Times. What about three blind mice? Three blind mice? That was one of the best. If you, uh, Charles Eisendrath has just interrupted me. Um, Charlie, sit still for a second. The next sentence reads this. I was the editor of the New York Times Magazine in 1991 when Ken published Three Blind Mice, how, how the TV networks lost their way. And we put it on the front page of the magazine, impressed as always by Ken's authority and thoroughness in reporting, his clarity in presentation, and his sure feel for narrative journalism. Ken, like his journalism, is deeply principled, outraged by injustice and sham, and motivated by a passion to set things right. He is tough-minded and demanding, but never theatrically adversarial. Moving through the world of loud mouths and self-recording, excuse me, self-regarding showboats, Ken has made his mark with a calm and reassuring manner and a voice so whispery that sometimes you have to strain to hear him. I wish I had time to tell you more about Ken, his upbringing in Coney Island, where two public spaces carry the names of his parents, Nettie Tannenbaum Oletta and Pat Oletta, who themselves met and married in Coney Island. His years at Abraham Lincoln High School, where his baseball skills far outshone his academic ones, but were enough to get him into SUNY Oswego. And the winsome girl he met when he was executive director of OTB, and she was... <laughs> Not enough? <laughs> and she was number two to the vice president of marketing, his wife of 41 years, Binky Urban. <laughs> the winsome Binky Urban. Still winsome. Uh, well, let me finish uh, with one recent instance of what a class act Ken is. I was with him one weekend in 2002 at his Bridgehampton summer house when he was grappling with an analyst of communication profile of Harvey Weinstein. He had developed reporting on Weinstein's sexual predation, but to his enormous frustration, he couldn't get victims to go on the record, so he was unable to make that part public. Last year, when he learned that Ronan Farrow had been able to get women to talk about Weinstein's abuse, he moved to give Farrow access to his long ago research, now in his papers at the New York Public Library. And as David Remnick records in a lovely appreciation of Ken that you'll find in the new Silurians News, Farrow tells everyone these days that he would have never won the Pulitzer for public service without Ken's encouragement and early reporting. By the way, Ken is now working on his 13th book, and it's a biography of Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Unlike some of us in this business, Ken doesn't spend much time calling attention to himself. What calls attention to Ken is the excellence of the work, which is a true reflection of the excellence of the man. He is a very deserving recipient of the Silurians Award for Lifetime Achievement, and President Andelman is now going to come up here and make this all official. Okay. I got to bring this down. I'm shorter than he is. Um, so, here it is. Thanks to Mike Kandel, who had this beautiful plaque. And I think he engraved it himself, actually, but I'm not real sure. Um, at any rate, um, now the cat's out of the bag. We know who is our 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award winner. And it falls to me simply to present Ken Oletta with this plaque and read on it the inscription that is deeply appropriate. 
the Society of the Silurians Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Ken Oletta in recognition of your remarkable career as an author, critic, magazine writer, and steadfast exponent of the highest standards of journalism and husband of the extraordinary, <laughs> winsome, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> And now he gets to earn this. Thank you, David. And thank you, Warren. Um, thank you for firing me. Um, and I, I might add, Warren called me a number of times to check facts for the introduction. And when I stopped returning his calls, when he asked me when I first had sex with my wife, my, win my winsome wife. Uh, David. Um, David is not an athlete, as you can see, and yet every year he comes to the Artists and Writers game, and I happen to be the coach or captain of, of the writers, and I happen to be the... No, no, actually, I have the good sense not to play you, uh, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I also uh, want to thank my wife, the winsome Minky Urban, and my daughter, Kate, uh, for once again suffering through one of my speeches. I became a journalist because I failed, as Warren suggested, at politics. I was the campaign manager for Howard Samuels, and he was 20 points ahead at one point when I was the campaign manager. He lost by 20 points. Um, I love the guy, but I'm, I'm grateful that, in retrospect, that we lost. Um, most days, however, I worry about another failure, and that's the failure of journalism. Bear with me as I take a few moments to discuss what Donald Trump has done to our profession. I confess I struggle with two opposite thoughts. One is sunny and one is bleak. On the one hand, I mostly agree with CNN President Jeff Zucker, who has said, and I quote, the one thing I know for sure is that Donald Trump has made America, American journalism great again. I marvel at the investigative reporting done, particularly by the New York Times and the Washington Post on Trump. I still can't comprehend why the year the New York Times spent reporting on, ta on Trump's tax returns and how he made his, his wealth um, has not received the kind of atomic attention it deserved. Um, I marvel at David Remnick's eloquent insistence that we not normalize Donald Trump's abnormal presidential behavior. I marvel at the probing questions that are asked by Jake Tapper or Chris Cuomo or Brian Stelter on CNN or NBC's Nicole Wallace. If you gave Trump a truth serum, too often he wouldn't tell the truth, but he speaks the truth when he says, quote, I've been good for the business of journalism. The digital edition of the New York Times is a rocket ship due in no small measure to Donald Trump coverage. The 60 Minutes interview with Stormy Daniels in March of this year was the most rate, best rated CBS show, 60 Minutes show in 10 years. CNN, Fox, and NBC are reveling in ratings glory. But there's the bleak news. Trump is our clickbait. For decades, a debate has raged whether the press is burdened by a liberal bias that distorts our coverage. I would argue that the central press bias that draws too little attention is our bias for conflict. As was true in the 2016 primary and the general election race, and as true of Trump's presidency, a blustery showman like Trump excites more and more coverage. Fox gets more clicks by serving as a Trump cheerleader, by bashing his rivals, by mostly ignoring the, the, the outrageous things he says or does. 
CNN and MSNBC make the opposite mistake. They are, in, they are fixated by Trump, crowding out most other news. In the words of one CNN correspondent, and I quote, we are the Trump news network. I too suffer from a Trump addiction. I find myself in late afternoons gravitating towards online or to television to find out what this man has done today. Jeff Zucker inadvertently revealed why there is too little reporting on non-Trump subjects when he told Joe Pompeo of Vanity Fair, and I quote, people say all the time, oh, I don't want to talk about Trump. I've had too much Trump. And yet the end of the day, all they want to do is talk about Trump. We've seen that any time you break away from the Trump story and cover other events, the audience goes away. I wish Zucker had said instead, my job as a journalist is to sometimes say to our audience, eat your spinach, because I'm a professional. Part of my job is to determine what's important, what belongs as the lead, what stories matter. I admire Jeff Zucker for having the guts to confront Donald Trump for his many falsehoods. I also admire him for defending and championing his troops at CNN. But too often, like MSNBC, his talented even evening anchors participate in a gladiatorial battle with Trump. Instead of coverage, we get conflict and punditry. We get inexpensive to produce moments featuring loud voices pounding the table. Too often, we behave like Donald Trump. We talk too much and listen too little. No news institution barks and grovels more than Fox News, in, particularly in prime time. They serve as an armed Trump cop, ready to punish those who stray. Why do almost 90% of Republicans support Trump? I blame Fox News. Our business journalism is a frightened profession. We've lost jobs and advertising and circulation. So we shout louder, get attention. To get attention, we promote conflict. We smirk, we tweet, we opine on cable news channels. Inevitably, we grant ammunition to Trump voters who believe we are out to get him. Consider this front page headline in the November 10th New York Times, quote, Trump finds a, finds a tack dog in fight against Mueller. The story referred to Trump's choice of Matthew Whitaker as acting attorney general. There were no quote signs around a tack dog. No one was cited accusing Whitaker of serving as an attack dog. Based on what Whitaker has said, I believe he is an attack dog. But that's an opinion. And the Times should not be placing editor or reporter opinions in their headlines, which ignites my biggest fear. Much of the public doesn't believe our facts. They ignore Pat Moynihan's wise adage, you're entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts. We have lost much of our authority. And we can't just blame Trump's outrageous and menacing attacks on us as enemies of the people or as evil. A president who seems to be mad out of his rocker is driving us mad. What to do? I don't have a 14 point plan, but I start with seven points. One, we must criticize Fox News, which has more impact on Trump supporters than anyone else and it deserves to be shamed. Two, unlike Trump, we need to be judicious. Three, unlike Trump, we need to be open to criticism. Four, we need to report more and talk less. Five, we shouldn't succumb to pessimism. For three decades, I've been a national judge of the Livingston Journalism Awards. 
Charles Eisendrath, who founded it, is actually joined us tonight from Michigan, but he's getting back to go to the big game, Michigan State versus Ohio State on, on Saturday. And every year we judges sit and we read these incredible, or watch these incredible TV and online entries of these young journalists who do miraculous work. There's a future in journalism, and we see it every year judging the Livingston Awards. Six, we need to act like professionals we claim to be and choose what we think is important and not just what excites an audience. Seven, finally, let's have another drink. Thank you for this award. Hi, um, congratulations on your award. I'm curious, what do you think about the future of platforms like Facebook and Google? Do you think that um, they will become utilities over time? Do you think they should have more regulation or do you think they'll just continue on the path of aggregating all our data and maybe ultimately becoming banks and controllers of our entire existence? What do you think? I, I think we're moving in this country to, towards more regulation after what we see happening in Western Europe. And that's a good thing. Um, they are... Um, uh, near monopolies. I mean, it's very hard to imagine how Facebook with 2.2 billion users, 97% um, of the revenue is coming from advertising, uh, can be displaced. I don't see Snapchat or Twitter coming along and, and displacing them. The government, and I think there's a bipartisan interest in one of the few areas where there's broad agreement for different reasons between Democrats and Republicans, is to better police and regulate um, digital giants like Facebook and Google and, and Amazon. Now, will the government know what to do? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't testify to that. But clearly things like what, what's happening in the European Union with privacy, where they basically have said that the idea that, that right now they have access to your data and you can only opt out if you go through this laborious process of opting out. In Europe, what they've done is said, in order to have access to your data, you must opt in. And I think there's a movement afoot to something like that happening in the U.S. There also is questions about whether, I mean, for instance, we allowed Facebook to go out and buy Instagram and WhatsApp, I mean, companies that, that threaten their, to be competitors to them, and they buy them. So there's a real question whether the government might step in and say, hey, you can't buy an Instagram. So I, I think you will see more regulation. The question in my mind is whether it's intelligent. I thought when the government tried to regulate Microsoft, and I covered that trial, the idea that, that you should break up Microsoft in, in 2000, I thought it was a cockamamie idea, because the internet was, open source was going to break them up, as it did, and you didn't have to have government bureaucracy trying to decipher which part should stay with Microsoft and which should, should not. But Ken, when, 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 when the Google other uh, search engines were allowed in Europe, so were people were allowed to remove anything about them on that search engine. That has dramatically changed the ability of any kind of research or wire right now. Well, it, it begs the question. Uh, well, the question is when, when the European Union decided to regulate and limit the data that a Google or, or a Facebook could could carry, did it not restrict the ability of people to do research and, and other, and yes it did. And so one of the basic questions always will be, do the bureaucrats who are, who are imposing these regulations know how to do it in an intelligent way? I mean, if you just watch the congressional hearings where Mark Zuckerberg was questioned by members of the Senate, including uh, Orrin Hatch, who, who asked him at one point, so tell us how Facebook makes its money? I mean, you say, uh, there's no way you want that person or these people to, to regulate. Oh, Ken, um, given the amount of uh, misinformation and lies that are given out at the Trump press conferences uh, by him and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, what do you think of the strategy of boycotting uh, some of those press conferences, just not covering him? Is that realistic? Uh, I, I don't think much of that. I, I think much more of the idea of not not stationing your reporters in the White House and get and forcing them to go out and report on the government and not wait for handouts. I mean, when, I, when I've done press pieces on the press coverage in the Bush administration and Obama administration, I was actually shocked at, at Peter Baker, who is arguably the best White House reporter at the New York Times, 
uh, best white out of all the reporters. And, but he and the TV people, I said, how do you do your reporting? And they say, well, most of it, we don't talk to people. We just instant message. We get, so I ask a, a one sentence question, I get a one sentence answer. And then they run out on the grass and they talk to every hour to the cable news. I mean, it's a hell of a way to report government. So I, 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 would, I would not impose a thing saying we will not cover, but I would insist, I would impose that I want my reporters out reporting and not waiting. Over here. Uh, Ken, a, a quick observation and then a question. Um, have you noticed yet that ABC News is pursuing a red state strategy to be the second Trump network as an alternative to Fox? All their scoops are Melania Trump's first interview, et cetera. The que bigger question is, when are you or some other media critic going to finally dispel the myth that the New York Times and the Washington Post constitute the mainstream media by adding up the circulation figures for all the platforms, Fox, Sinclair, et cetera, versus the Times and the Post? Um, I, I have, um, I, I wasn't aware of the ABC. I'm not aware of it. I, I tend not to watch, well, watch ABC now. News, um, uh, by, by deliberately, I mean, not to watch it. Um, but the, uh, I, I, Clearly, the, the press out there is, uh, out of the New York Times, the Washington Post, is, is very powerful in shaping opinion. And that's why I said in my, in my remarks, I think Fox News has more to say about shaping Republican attitudes. People increasingly in a world where you can get the news you want and, and, and fed to you to reinforce your beliefs, that's a dynamic that's happened in our society. And it's very worse. I mean, it's one of the reasons why people accept their own sets of facts yeah. and don't accept universal sets of facts. I don't believe the New York Times, they say. I don't believe Washington Post. I believe Fox. And that's, how to break that is really a profound problem. Over here. Oh. Ken, hi, I'm Gary Paul Gates. Anyway, uh, <laughs> forgive the prelude of this. I'm kind of a prelude guy, but it'll be brief. Uh, Early in Franklin Roosevelt's first term, uh, he sent John Nance Garner, his vice president, up to the, the Capitol Hill to find out how the progress of a bill was going along. He was pessimistic about it. That's why he sent Garner. And Garner came back and he said, well, what is it? And, and Garner said, well, Captain, do you want it with the bark on or the bark off? And Roosevelt said, uh, with the bark off. He said, it's not going anywhere. I mention that because what Trump has been giving us in his assaults on the press is with the bark off. When he says all the things about enemy of the people and everything, but I feel compelled possibly because of my own association with the previous period. We've seen this movie before. Richard Nixon gave it to us with the bark on. The difference was that those plots were concealed from within. But I don't quite, and I'm asking you this, I don't quite know the difference between the frontal attack of enemy of the people and Richard Nixon in the summer and fall of 72 instructing his White House counsel, John Dean, to draw up an enemies, enemies list. And when Dean asked him why, he said because the idea is to screw our enemies, especially those in the media. Now, is there, a, you know, that was surreptitious, but... Uh, but I, I think being surreptitious makes a difference. I, I'm not arguing, I wouldn't challenge your notion that, that, that Nixon was as angry and paranoid about the press as Donald Trump. Uh, and by the way, the other president, Bill Clinton at one point, even Obama at one point were very paranoid about the press. But there's a difference between tell, privately telling John Dean to do something and Trump literally calling us enemy of the people and evil and endangering the lives of reporters and reinforcing a view that we are enemies of the people. We shouldn't be cooperating and what we are doing 
every time we criticize him, is creating fake news. That is way beyond what even crazy Nixon did in all his anger. And I... Pardon? But it didn't happen. What I'm saying is what, what Trump is doing is actually dang, dangerous to reporters who cover and dangerous to a democracy because it's basically saying, don't believe what you read. And, and, and elections are stolen by, and, and fraud is committed. I mean, it makes all these outrageous claims that are, are menacing to a democracy, I would argue. Well, why do you think so many of his supporters really believe him. I mean, look, uh, I'm not a psychologist, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, they they believe the facts that they are fed about that. They believe they are angry, and he matches and strokes their anger, and they're angry for a lot of good reasons. In many cases, I mean, they feel marginalized. In some cases, bad reasons, like they feel like they're white. And, and, and lives are challenged and, and threatened by, uh, by immigrants or by people of, of different color and religions. Um, I, I, think, I don't think there's any one answer to that question, Mike, but the fact is that 40 or 42 percent support he has has been pretty impregnable. But I would argue, uh, just venturing an opinion, that he had a terrible loss in this midterm election. And 42% does not get you an electoral victory if you have just one Democrat, one candidate you're opposing. Uh, in a different area, what, uh, what don't we know yet about Harvey Weinstein? What do we have yet to learn? <laughs> I mean, uh, when, when did it start? Uh, was he always, was he a predator? Uh, I don't mean a physical bully. That, I mean, people like me wrote a lot about that. But the physical predation, when did that begin? What are the sources of it? Um, what is, um, how much is explained by power? How do you explain what a, a man who does some of these, these beastly acts, how does he explain what he did after he's done it? endlessly fascinated by that question. Uh, I have the same question about when Les Moonves traps a, a doctor in an office and insists that she watch him masturbate. I mean, here's this cultured, sophisticated, Hall of Fame television executive. After that happened, how does he explain to himself? Does he explain to himself? Is it another person who did that in his mind? I mean, I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by Harvey Weinstein, what he did in movies. I mean, all of this doesn't wipe out the fact that he was a pretty brilliant, uh, for a number of years, movie executive with, and I remember when I profiled him in 2002, I was awed by his knowledge of movies. And, and so there are lots, uh, I'm interested in the enablers. Who are the people, did they know, and if they knew, what did they do about it, or why did they not do more about it? So it, for me, it's a, it's a full array of, of questions. Ken, back here. Uh, you've talked on a, on a very national level, uh, you know, with reference to the top media, but what's happening across the country in covering state houses and, and uh, county councils and city councils? When I tr travel, so when I do travel around the country, I, I, I see a wasteland of, of print media and not much on broadcast media about what's really happening. So who's keeping track of what's going on and, and what should be done to keep better track? And, and this is on national, and, I mean, on local and state level. Forget about the national level, which you have been talking about. What, what about beneath that level? Uh, you could make an argument that the... <laughs> One of the most serious challenges in journalism is the lack of local news, the lo lo lack of local investigative reporting, the lack of local press to challenge mayors and governors. Um, and one of the things, I mean, I think about all the time is when you look at the economics of the news business, I don't know how 10, 15 years from now, newspapers 
like the Detroit News, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, many of the local newspapers can survive, and the smaller papers. I don't know how they survive. And even Warren Buffett, who thought he had, you know, Golden Goose and buying all these local newspapers, he's moving away from that and curbing and beginning to cut. It's very hard for those local newspapers to make it by charging online. And it's very hard for them, if they don't want to charge online, to get charge advertisers for online news and get enough income from that. And with Facebook and Google and other sources of, of information, not all of it very good information, replacing those local newspapers, I, I think that you raise one of the fundamental worries of the future of journalism. What about local news? I mean, Dean, I've heard Dean Beckay, the editor of the New York Times, talk about that he thinks the biggest crisis in journalism is lack of local news. Ken, over here. Ken, one of the things, going back to Fox News, one of the things that strikes me is that the stranglehold that he has on Fox News, this calling the commentators every evening and telling them what the, the, the topic is, and his being totally advised uh, by the Irishman, you know, whatever, and getting the calls in the White House. He controls the Republican Party because the Republicans are afraid to show their morality or dissent because they know if they do that, they will be destroyed by him. And that is power. So, how do you, I mean, we had a very good scene in the midterm election, but we're not totally there yet. How do you break that media control in a situation where Fox owns a whole segment of America, and then there is the echo chamber on social media. I come back to the word shame. And, and let me tell you a story that, that I remember when I was covering the New York City fiscal crisis. Um, a. Beam, the mayor of New York, decided to, that they had to close some city university campuses. They were in 21 city universities. And one of them that he decided to close was John Jay College. And he got the vote of the Board of Estimate, including Jay Gold and, and some others, to vote to close John Jay College. The president of John Jay College, his office was across the street from Tony Schwartz. Remember Tony Schwartz? Tony Schwartz was the media maestro who created that little girl picking daisies for Lyndon Johnson in the, in the, in the that campaign, 64 campaign. And it ran only once. We think of it running multiple times. It ran 30 second ad, her picking little daisies, 30, 29, two, one, boom, atomic bomb goes off. It's very powerful. So the president of John Jay College came across the street to Tony Schwartz's office. And Tony Schwartz rarely left his office. And he said, Mr. Schwartz, we need your help to try and save John Jay College. And he said, how much money do you have? And he says, we had $30,000. He said, well, with $30,000, you can run a radio campaign. And we can run it on three radio stations, WINS, CBS radio, all news, and WNEW, the big band sound, make-believe ball. And they ran ads, which were very personal. And they said, Abe Beam says he believes in higher education. Why don't you ask Abe Beam why he wants to close John Jay College, which is, A. Beam says he believes in police protection. Why don't you ask A. Beam why he wants to close? Jay Golden, the city controller, says he believes in more police. Why don't you ask him? And these ads run. Within two weeks, Mayor A. Beam called up and made a visit to Tony Schwartz's office. And he surrendered. John Jay College thrives today. He produced ads that shamed a. Beam, Jay Golden, and the Board of Estimate. You got a shame. I mean, I, there were two weeks, a week and a half ago, uh, Lachlan Murdoch appeared before the New York Times conference. And he said, um, he was talking, he was interviewed by Andrew Ross Sorkin. He was talking about how much he loved, how Fox News was good. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a typecast as a conservative, he said. I'm, 
I am uh, liberal on social policies and conservative on economic policies. So I raised my hand in the question prayer. I said, well, how do you feel about uh, Fox News? He said, well, it, it, it's wonderful, and, but I would never interfere. And I said, and I then followed up with a question. I said, well, you say you won't interfere, um, but would you like to? Are you proud of what Fox News done? And there was an audible gasp in the audience. And the truth is, that's what we have to do. We just have to press these people. They shouldn't be proud. Yeah, it makes $2 billion a year for them. But they're human beings, and they want to integrate with people, and, and he's moving in Hollywood circles and stuff. And some of his people who are on Fox Network have said they deplore Fox News. I think you got to play that shame card with these people. Well, Ken, you sort of anticipated the question I was going to ask. I mean, when you're talking about shaming the Murdochs, do you think that, that the Murdoch's sons are any more capable of feeling shame than Rupert Murdoch is? Well, certainly James Murdoch is, which is one of the reasons he privately, his wife supported, not privately, his wife supported Hillary Clinton, James Murdoch's wife. Uh, he is an environmentalist, as is his wife, uh, and privately is very critical of Fox News and feels it, it poisons the politics. Um, now, Lachlan is different. He was a former publisher of the New York Post. Um, but he, nevertheless, he's a, he and his wife move in circles um, different than the circles that Rupert Murdoch moved in. And so, yeah, I, I think you can shame people. It, at least it's, it's a shot. Um, because if you, if you just took dollars and cents, they're going to continue with, this is the 40% of the income, the new Fox comes from Fox News. You're very optimistic, but you, can you quote any signs of that change? <laughs> well, I mean, you, we, we've seen little glimmers of where they reprimanded, um, What's his name? Uh, the he called the Irishman, um, who who went and stood and endorsed, basically endorsed Trump on stage two weeks ago, and and Sean Hannity, yeah, and and that was they didn't name him by name when they but they basically reprimanded and said our anchors should not be doing that. Um, little glimmer, it's not, but it's only a glimmer. Ken, I had a question. Uh, and first of all, congratulations to you for this uh, honor, and it, it's terrific to be with you and to get to know you tonight. What do we do about media literacy? I was so struck as a, an editor who works at a primarily local uh, operation over in New Jersey at the record about how uh, the whole industry, all of us are concerned about how people are not necessarily turning to local news, which is a fundamental stepping stone to understanding how the rest of the news works, right? So, so what do we do as an industry to try to address media literacy, to try to build media literacy, obviously beyond investing in it, which you know, every year that passes, we have fewer coins to spend on anything, including payroll. But how, what, what is our mission, in, in your view, in terms of building media literacy? Because I think that's a fundamental issue that has created this situation that you're feeling a ton of questions about, and possibly a fundamental issue for this group moving forward. Boy, I wish I had an answer for that question. I, I, I don't begin to have one. Um, I do think that we have to set a standard, and it goes back to what I said about what I wish Jeff Zucker, a man I respect, by the way, in, in many, many ways, and even like. Um, I think we, we have to, we're professionals, and, and, and we got to communicate. Professionals have judgment. Uh, based on experience and what's a lead, what's a front page story, what's not a lead story, what a reliable source or what is not a reliable source. Um, that's certainly part of media literacy, but it doesn't get to the heart of your question. Um, and I don't know how to. Oh, Ken, congratulations on your award. You. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think there's anything that the media can do to play a greater role in somehow trying to prevent mass shootings? Well, I mean, you can make an argument we should cover it less, but I hate that idea in, in so many ways because you, you, know, you want people to feel the hurt and, and the outrage of what, 
what's happening. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm of the view that when people automatically say gun control would solve it, some of the people who commit these acts have licensed guns, um, and some of them are, are, you know, are crazy. And so, I mean, it, 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 which leads me to the conclusion, if, if you really want to address that problem, maybe you have to ban guns. And I don't know how the hell you do that. Ken, is Trump going to survive this administration? You see, if I were one of the pundits on TV, I would opine with that, with an answer for that. I have no idea. <laughs> Are you frightened? Do you get scared? My, my wife looks at him every morning and says, I can't look at him anymore. I hope that's what she says. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's close. I hope. I have, I, we don't have evidence yet, yeah. except they do sleep in separate bedrooms. But you're optimistic in some ways. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. I, I, I mean, I, I am really curious what Mueller comes up with, and I hope, and with the Democrats in the House, that will strengthen that, potentially. Uh, but who knows what Trump will do? I can imagine Trump firing Mueller. I can imagine him going to the barricades. And it's scary. I don't know. I don't have a strong view. We'll take Mary to take one last question from the inimitable Mary Gretzky. Hold it, Mary. You can correct me if I'm totally ignorant, but as I recall, the networks had to promise and had to perform in fairness. They had to be balanced um, in order to keep their licenses. And then along came cable um, that a lot of uh, Cassandra's warned about. And there is no obligation for them to be fair. Do you think we could get legislation so that they would have to behave the way the networks did? It, it, was, it's, it was known as the Fairness Doctrine. Right. And what it said was that um, basically the networks worried about the congressional oversight, that if we didn't balance and have two sides, um, then we, we could lose our license. But they didn't automatically lose their license. They could if Congress so so moved to do that. Do I see that ha fairness coming back, fairness doctrine coming back? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. And in part because you got so many different points of view. And I mean, if you think about it, the conservative argument today is that the press is so biased, and, and, and Facebook and, and Google are biased in, in their algorithms. So they're trying to screw us. And they don't want a fairness doctrine. They just want, want to bludgeon them into giving them more attention and less mm. criticism. I, I don't see the fairness doctrine coming back. And look, look at debates. I mean, the fairness doctrine would say have, everyone should have a say. But people don't want to have five, six candidates from different parties in a presidential race or a mayoral race on the stage. I don't see it. I, I just want to say, I, I, I want to just say in closing, I, I'm really appreciative for this award and for seeing so many of my old friends here and you all look great. Thank you. We're all thriving, and just wait for the announcement for the December lunch. It's going to be very special. There we go.